Hello there, everybody. I'm Al Sussman from Beatle Fan Magazine, and this is Things We Said Today, our, uh, our weekly podcast, uh, or an internet radio show in which we talk about all things Beatles related and uh, not only their history, but also what's, uh, what's happening now. And we have a uh, we have a special guest tonight. Before we introduce him, I'll introduce my uh, my three co-hosts. Uh, first, the uh, the host of um, internet radio and and I believe terrestrial some terrestrial stations as well. Uh, the syndicated uh, program uh, Every Little Thing. Uh, Ken Michaels. Hi there, Al. You sound great coming from. The Pittsburgh area. Yes, now in, in <laughs> Western Pennsylvania. So we're all we're in many different locations, <laughs> spread out, and <laughs> all I'm, across the country, all over the country, including just at. Are you just outside of San Francisco or in San Francisco, Steve? Oh, I'm I'm out. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm outside San Francisco. Outside Somebody. San Francisco, and that yeah. voice. Uh, belongs to the Examiner, uh, Beatles Examiner, and various Examiner columns uh, r- reporter Steve Marinucci. Hi, Al. Hi, hi everyone. <laughs> and then in Maine, uh, we have our resident uh, classical music expert, musicologist, uh, Beatles music expert, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, longtime uh, contributor to, uh, to Beatle fan, and that would be Alan Cozen. Hello, Al. Hello, everyone. And we have a we have a special guest. Um, if you're uh, if you attended the Fest for Beatles fans any time in say the last three years, uh, you know this man. He's the author of a uh, an exhaustive and very heavy uh, <laughs> two uh, two part look at the three Beatles tours of the U.S. in 1964, 65, and 66. Uh, it's, a, it's an amazing, amazing uh, book, pair of books. And his name is Chuck Gunderson. Hello, gentlemen. It's great to be with you and a uh, pleasure to be with four distinguished Beatle people that I love very much. So thanks for having me on. Thank you very Our much. Pleasure. For, for, uh, and, where, and where are you coming from, Chuck, yes. right now? I'm coming from a very small town two hours north of Las Vegas called St. George, Utah. Mm-hmm. And uh, we'll be living here for a little bit longer than hopefully getting back down to our home of San Diego, California. That's where we're, my, uh, we're raised and bred, and that's where I love. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, I, I, I'm going to start off now. We actually, uh, I've uh, Chuck and I have done panel discussions and one-on-one interviews and various things many times at the fest. So this is going to be old territory, but I figure the audience really should kind of know about this. Uh, because first of all, uh, Chuck, you're out of the public relations area, right? Or the, or the advertising world. Yeah, I spent most of my life in the advertising world uh, over 35 years. Uh, but I also have two degrees in history, um, mm-hmm. of a master's, uh, well, BA from San Diego State University and then a master's from University of San Diego. So history is really my passion. And of course, I've been a Beatle fan forever. I attended my first Beatle Fest in 1979, I believe. So I've been on the circuit for a long time. Mm-hmm. And uh, so finally, when I had some time in my life, I really turned my sights to writing these pair of books. And what led to writing those pair of books, that pair of books? <laughs> Lots of things. Number one, uh, I love Mark Lewis and great friend of mine. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mark wrote that fabulous book, Beatles Live, mm-hmm. pre-internet days. Okay. I don't know how he found out all those, that information. I still refer to that book today. I love that book. It was the inspiration for what I wanted to do. And um, I've been a collector for many years as well. And as you know, in the Beatle world, you can collect lots of things. And I decided that uh, I really wanted to set my sights on North American tour memorabilia, which, you know, there's not a lot of things to collect, but on a budget, you can collect things. So I kind of paired those two things up and I kind of realized that, um, you know, Mark had documented all the concerts, but there wasn't a lot of detail, wasn't a lot of photos, memorabilia, things like that. And I thought, 
why don't I turn my sights on to the three North American tours? Because no one has really tackled all three together. I mean, we have Larry Kane's marvelous book, you know, Ticket to Ride. Bruce mm -hmm. Spies covered the first visit in February. But no one had ever really done the three tours. Um, so I thought, that's, that's right up my alley. And I know how to research, and I'm going to do it. And, but I set some very lofty goals. And I think because of those lofty goals, that's why it took me eight years to, to finish the project. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, you just mentioned Bruce Beiser. So obviously Bruce was a major factor in the completion of this project. Yeah, Bruce is a great friend of mine. I've known him for quite a while. And I always told Bruce, I go, Bruce, you need to do your next book on the tours. And he said, Chuck, I'm too busy. <laughs> and, uh, I would ask him every Beatle Fest that I would see him at. Come on, Bruce, when are you going to do that? Because the thing about Bruce is not only is his research unparalleled, but the way he puts a book together. I mean, he spares no expense. He, you know, uh, great photographs, great you know, weight to the book. And it's just a beautiful product. And so... I kind of wanted to marry all these things together, you know, the knowledge of Lewison, the beauty of Bruce's books, and of course his expertise. And uh, so I told Bruce one Beetle Fest, I said, hey, let me do this project. I know you're busy. I really have time now. I want to do it, and I'm going to do it. And he said, go for it. And he's been a great mentor through mm -hmm. the process and remains a great friend today. Absolutely. Well, before I start hogging the questions like I do at the fest, let me send you over to Ken, because I'm sure he's got plenty of questions of his own. Oh, yeah. And by the way, Chuck, uh, the book, people always ask me, and I'm sure they've asked people here on this show what books they recommend on the Beatles. Yours is amongst the top, mm -hmm. because it's the most comprehensive look that there could be on those three years and, and the shows that the Beatles did here in, in North America. Everything you'd ever want to know about each concert is covered in the book, so I have to commend you for that. The last time you were on our show, which was with just Steve and me, we were talking a lot about the year 1966, and sometimes I find it hard to understand how some of the shows in 1966 didn't sell out. But what I was amazed to find, because I really wanted to focus on 65 uh, for this show, although we can expand beyond that, is that so many of the shows in 1965 didn't sell out from the Beatles. Yeah, you're, you're outside right. of... Yeah. Outside of uh, Shea and, and the Hollywood Bowl shows and uh, the show in Portland, Oregon, uh, most of the other ones, I believe, didn't sell out at all. So why do you suppose that was? Well, there's lots of factors. I mean, uh, you would think that the, the thing that we hear most, obviously, is the Shea concert. You know, August 15th, 1965, 55,600 seats. And a lot of people have the mistaken belief uh, Beatle fans, casual fans, things like that, that after Shea, they sold everything out, you know, both on the 65 tour and the 66 tour. And when I started looking at the numbers, it just wasn't the case. But let's look at something. I mean, to bring 30,000, 35,000 people to a venue in the mid 60s to see a rock and roll act was quite a feat. And mm -hmm. so despite them not selling out venues post uh, Shea Stadium, they brought a heck of a lot of people to go see concerts. <laughs> right. Was it difficult to figure out which, which venues to book the Beatles? Because I know that you say in your book they were conscious of trying to play areas that they hadn't played the previous year. We're talking 65 here. And um, at the same time, they had to be so careful, the size of the venues, because this was as big a leap in terms of size as you could get. So not only that, but there were certain venues that they played twice, where they did an afternoon and evening show. So they had to put that thought process together. Could they sell out both shows in the same day? So was that a tough process to go through? Yeah, it was. And you have to put it kind of in historical context. In 1964, when they came back in August, uh, you know, in the early January of, or the spring of 64, you know, Brian met with General Artists Corporation, Norman Weiss. He was the vice mm. president of that New York talent agency. And Norman had sent him a big, long list of the cities, the venues, and where they could play. And uh, Brian went through that list, and I, I've actually got it 
uh, copy of it in the book. I mean, all the pages, there's coffee stains all over it and everything. And he, I imagine he poured over this thing, you know. Here's the deal, though. I mean, the Beatles were used to playing to people in the U.K., 2,000, 3,000 seats a night, you know, when they played the Empire Pool, you know, for the uh, NME Awards, you know, they're looking at about 8,000 people there. Then they go down to Australia and they play to 10,000 people down there. But once they get to the States, the venues are much larger. And GAC kind of just threw everything against a, a wall, you know, and had Brian select it. So Brian had offers to play at, you know, uh, Detroit's Tiger Stadium, 50,000 seats. And he had offers to play at Fenway Park in Boston. He had offers to play the L.A. Coliseum, 80,000 seats in L.A. Elvis had played some venues and when he was going around. But, you know, the largest venue he played was the Cotton Bowl, like 26,000 seats. So here, here are these things just be thrown at Brian. Brian's somewhat unfamiliar with the American market. I mean, he's relying on GAC to give him some great advice and things like that. But I think Brian was intuitive as he went through this list realizing, like, so Brian was given a selection of all these large venues. And you have to remember, too, like rock and roll managers, I mean, they don't have the greatest reputation. They're Back then, they were always out for themselves and not really looking out for their artists. And, you know, with Brian being offered all these huge venues all around the country, he, he could have built it for all he was worth. But instead, what he decided to do, and I, I think it's to Brian's complete credit, he doesn't get a lot of credit for this, is he chose venues that were smaller. He chose arenas. He chose outdoor amphitheaters in 1964. Um, sure, he played three stadiums in 1964, and they weren't sellouts either. But they drew a heck of a lot of people. And um, so Brian, he could have really just burned the bridge right there in 64 by booking these huge venues and not a lot of people filling those venues. Uh, mm. But instead, he did the opposite. And what, what that did is it created this pent-up demand. So when they did come back in 65, and especially that Shea Stadium show, which... In my opinion, New York City is the epicenter of everything Beatles. He was able to fill that, 55,600 seats. Right, right. Just, just one other question about, well, in general, one thing that I, that I found to be quite interesting, and maybe there's a reason behind it, is that for all three years, 64, 65, and 66, they always played in Toronto at Maple Leaf Garden. Is there any particular reason for that? The most braced stage in all North American Beatles tour history is, is Toronto Maple Leafs Garden. That stage was graced six times by the Beatles, which mm. is uh, pretty amazing. But I want to go back on a question you asked, Ken, and how the cities were selected and things like that. When the Beatles come to America in those three years, they're for sure 100% always going to play the big cities. They're going to play New York. They're going to play Chicago. They're going to play L.A., they're also going to play regional cities where Beatle records are selling. And so that's why in 1964 you got a lot of concerts up in the Rust Belt. Because you look at the Rust Belt now, which is Michigan and, you know, uh, you know Illinois and, and, and places like that where manufacturing was happening and where people were living. I mean, they mm. really spent a lot of time up in the Northeast. And that's where a lot of Beatle records were selling. And in Canada, they're going to obviously play the major cities. Uh, they only played West once in Vancouver, but they're always, every three years, they're going to go to a major city in Canada, and that happened to be Toronto. So to answer your question, the major cities always got them every three years. And then the lesser-known cities, the smaller regional cities, had the fortunate luck to have the Beatles come through town. Okay. And if you notice, when you look at the the schedule for 66 particularly, you're seeing a lot, a lot less of those, as, as Chuck just said, the, the Rust Belt cities. You don't see Indianapolis and you don't see, as a matter of fact, Pittsburgh and some others. You know, they're, they're mostly the major, the major markets. And, of course, the fact that they were in those major markets on that 66 tour, they were playing largely stadiums. Yeah, well, in 64, um, they, as I mentioned, they played three stadiums. 
And a lot of people think that after they played Shea Stadium in, in 65, that the Beatles only played at stadiums. Mm -hmm. And that's a bit of a misnomer because yes, uh, yeah. in 65, you know, they played, they played five stadiums, but they also played five arenas. And of course, the Hollywood Bowl, which is an outdoor venue. Mm -hmm. The difference is, is with the smaller venues, like the arenas and the Hollywood Bowl, Instead of playing one show like they did in 65, they're going to do two shows, no doubt. So they're going to play five big stadiums, and then they're going to play five arena or outdoor amphitheaters, but they're going to add a second show to that to rake in more money. So they made as much or more money in half the time in 65 than they did in 64 when they had to play 32 shows in 33 days. So hmm. Brian had it figured out. Right. right. Very true. Very true. Uh, Alan, uh, let me uh, see what you have to, uh, have to contribute here. Um, you know, what I'm actually interested in is, uh, I mean, the, the activities of the tours and, and everything were, are, are obviously fascinating, but I'm sort of interested in um, other aspects of how the book came together. You have probably every significant document Re mm -hmm. referring to the tours reproduced in here and reproduced in in color so that you can see you know the ink of the signatures is different from you know everything else and um i'm just wondering you know how you managed to pry these things loose from the people who had them um and and whether you were surprised that they still existed even um and also you know how you managed to get a lot of the detail here i mean this really sort of puts you this book puts you sort of right in the sort of in the car with them. You know, you know what they're eating for almost every tour stop, and uh, mm -hmm. and who brought it to them, and and other very arcane things. Um, and the research on that must have been um, astonishing because you know quite a quite a lot of people who have the materials that you wanted to reproduce here um, usually don't let you do it. So how did you manage to to get all of that? Well, Alan, a simple answer is a lot of begging. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of begging. I see. That worked. <laughs> um, yeah, but that was one of the goals for the book. I mean, I had seen other books that just had scant information in it, maybe a middle section of photos, um, black and white, uh, thin paper, mm. just not well produced. Um, so what I did, I mean... Having a master's in history, I mean, I know how to research. I learned that. I learned how to do that. So you always want to, first thing you want to do is always go to the primary sources of the day. You want to go to the newspaper banks and, and all that and read all those articles and all the teen magazines and everything that you can find because they're pretty reliable, believe it or not. Um, it's amazing, though, that when the Beatles came to, to towns, the paper hardly published anything about the visit. They didn't publish the set list. And that's why in some cities we still don't know if certain songs were played. We're still trying to figure that out. But another goal of the book was um, not only getting these documents, which, were, which is an incredible find. And remember, this took eight years to, to uh, produce. So I had lots of time to try to procure these documents. And when you read the documents, it really gives you a window as to what was going on behind the scenes. Reading Brian Epstein's six-page manuscript that GAC typed up for him with all the venues that they could have played on the 64 tour and Brian's tea stains on the paper and Brian's handwritten notes on the paper, it really gives you an insight as to how he thought about this and how everything transpired. So, yes, getting the documents was paramount in putting this book together. It was a huge boon to get all these things so and i've been a collector for a lot of times a lot of these are in my possession so i just took them out of my collection mm -hmm. um and then another goal was the photographs i mean how many times have we gotten beetle books and looked forward to getting them and it's like oh yeah i've seen that oh yeah i've seen that photo i really wanted to find photos that had been lost for decades Mm -hmm. And another goal was to have photos from every stop they made in North America, which was quite daunting to begin with. Uh, and it really came down to the end. After eight years, I was still scurrying around for a few cities. Um, you know, in places like Montreal, that's a hard place to work because, you know, it's French Canadian up there. You got to speak French. 
So I actually had to hire someone to help me up there to, to get to unearth some of these photos. And so I'm really proud to say that in the book, in the two volumes, there are photos from every show they did. And they're not just stage photos. They're press conference photos. They're airport arrival photos, uh, ho uh, photos from the hotel room, you know, just out and about type photos. You know, I even have a photo of like the plane landing on the tarmac, which mm -hmm. by the mm. way, looked up the tail number on that plane, and that was the plane that crashed in 1966, killing mm. everyone on board. So it's just like little details like that that I love to kind of do. And then lastly, to reproduce them in a high quality format. Um, you know, and this is where my people that helped me with my book, you know, uh, Brad Zucroff and Bambi, Bambi Nicklin from Omnivorous Media, they told me, they said, Chuck, if you're doing a book like this, it's got to be really nice. And we suggest you doing this. I'm so glad I listened because we did extra thick paper. It's a, an enlarged book. It's all the photos and documents and memorabilia have spot varnish on them. So they come off the page. We have like pages dedicated just to one contract. So you can <laughs> read all the fine hmm. and everything. And that, that was kind of the goal. And I'm, I hope that I accomplished that. Mm hmm. No, definitely. With the photos, I mean, um, in a way, you would have been competing with Apple, which has been voraciously gobbling up every photo collection it, it can get its hands on. Um, so did you run into some frustrations in terms of rights and things? Yeah, at the very beginning, when I was researching the Las Vegas show, um, the Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Bureau actually owns the archive of the Beatles' visit to there. And so when I contacted them and told them about the book, they said, Chuck, there's no problem. Go ahead, use the photos, but there's one caveat. And I said, well, what's that? They said, you have to get permission from Apple to use them. I thought, oh, wow, that's, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking this under my breath, obviously. So I contacted someone that knew people at Apple. I, had, I didn't know anybody at Apple. They said, just email this person. I said, okay. And I, I emailed them on a Thursday. And I actually got a reply on Monday, and they said, we look forward to this project. You're more than welcome to use these photos, uh, mm -hmm. which was amazing to me. And I really appreciated them doing that for me. But a lot of these photos that I got are actually in public archives, because I called not only you know, um, colleges, universities, uh, historical society, both state historical societies, uh, county archives, state archives, city archives, uh, libraries from all over the United States. And it's interesting, some libraries in Denver had photos from New York, and some libraries in New York had photos from San Diego. So matching that all up and then trying to figure out the photos again as to what city they were in, uh, right. that was really difficult. And uh, so one thing I followed was my... My mantra on that was follow the clothing. Right. Mm -hmm. Follow the clothing, because you'll which know. Which conscious John wore the cap at and which ones he didn't. And, yeah. yeah. And getting <laughs> off the plane and what they were wearing the day before and everything. Yeah. So it's piecing right. all that right. together. Mm -hmm. Before uh, we bring Steve into, into the discussion, when you mentioned the lack of set lists uh, in the, you know, the contemporary reportage of, of the tour, uh, especially in 64. Uh, it reminded me of a discussion that you and Alan and I think Bruce and I had at the New York Fest in February of last year. And that is, takes in also Alan's uh, ebook uh, Got That Something. And that's the fact that we, I guess, even to this moment, still do not definitively know the last time that the Beatles performed I Want to Hold Your Hand. That's right. That's right. I'm still looking. <laughs> Alan, don't give up because you have a researcher still hot on the trail. I'm beating down every bush I can find. I'm actually still going to answer your question. And I hope to find, because uh, you know what? Luckily, the fans kept historical records. And the record they kept was their program. And on their programs, in their neat little handwriting, they wrote in order the song list. And yeah. so I'm hoping the Paramount program will, will uh, arrive someday on eBay or at an auction. 
we're inside or on the back cover, which is a very nice place to write notes, uh, we'll nice. see the song list. So I think we'll finally find out one of these days if they did sing I Want to Hold Your Hand at the New York Paramount to end the tour in 64. Right. And that would have been the last time that they could have performed it. We just don't know whether they did or didn't because um, a peculiarity of I Want to Hold Your Hand seems to have been that when they dropped any song in the 1964 set list, it was that. So, mm -hmm. you know, so we that just was, don't know whether they did it or didn't. And we're still trying to find out if they played Kansas City in Kansas City. I have half the people say they did, half the people say they don't. I also, uh, in uh, Minneapolis, um, someone had told me that when they played there in 65, that they dropped Twist and Shout because John had a, a very scratchy throat. And I'm thinking to myself, well, he sang the rest of the songs at the concert. You know, <laughs> right. That mm. one, you know. So, it, you know, to, sometimes it doesn't make sense. And, but until we see several, until we see several um, documents, historical documents, meaning tour programs uh, the, with fans' handwritten scrawls on it, we're not going to know. So we're always going to keep that, uh, keep an eye out for that. Um, one question that you had left open uh, in at the time that you finished the book was whether or not they actually had monitor stage monitors, as claimed by the sound guy in Atlanta. Have mm. you have you gotten closer to discovering whether that's true or not? Yeah, that's a great uh, that's a great uh, question, Alan. And uh, in the book, I I actually kind of knew the answer, but I, what I wanted to do was to let the fans decide. So I presented both sides of the story. Uh, mm. But the story is is that Baker Audio, a Peach Peachtree Street address in Georgia, one of the one of the leading sound pioneers in the Southeast. Uh, decided at Atlanta Stadium when they played there on August 18th, 1965, that they would provide fullback speakers or sound monitors on stage so the Beatles could actually hear themselves. So we have a bit of evidence on that because, and luckily we have a great bootleg from that show, and Paul mentions how loud it is uh, mm -hmm. you know, she's a woman, and before Dizzy Miss Lizzie, John says, hey, we can hear ourselves. So the problem was is we didn't have a lot of photos from Atlanta, and a good friend of mine who lives down there said, I think I know where I can get some. Um, and so he sent me five or six stage photos, and of course it was the standard stage setup that you would have saw at Shea Stadium or any of the other stops, and the standard stage setup you would have saw in 1966. What's interesting is that a few weeks ago I was sent a photo, and I posted it on my Facebook page, if you go to uh, Facebook, uh, Beatles Some Fun Tonight, you'll see this new photo that I found from Atlanta that shows kind of a ground shot, a corner shot that shows a gaggle of speakers, huge speakers. And actually, my book uh, friend who helped, uh, Brad Zucroft, helped uh, with the book, actually knew what those speakers were and commented. So you can look at the comments on that. Uh, he knows exactly what they are. But it... It doesn't really appear to have any speakers pointing back towards them. Baker Audio today will still say that they invented the fullback monitor and was on stage that night, but a lot of the sound engineers that I've talked to who worked during that time just said the technology wasn't available. They're clearly not on the stage through photographic evidence, but Baker claims that they were on the field about 15 to 20 feet away from the stage. So. Until we see those photos, we'll never know. But we have a good good evidence with that new photo I posted on my Facebook. Yeah, that, that photo, I'm looking at it now, it, it, it comes pretty close to 15 to 20 feet away in front of them, and you don't see You see speakers facing out, it looks like. Right, out into the field. facing in. Yeah. Interesting. So, huh. yeah. I know that Steve <laughs> is chomping at the bit to get in on this discussion. <laughs> Sorry, so let's, Steve. Let's bring Steve in. Oh, that, that, that's all right. That's all right. Um, actually, you kind of got into part of what I was going to ask was if anything else had turned up since the publication of the book, and is there a possibility that you're going to issue a supplement uh, of some kind with any of the new material that's shown up, Chuck? You know, at this point, I am not going to do that. I've decided that uh, what I printed is what I printed, and as soon as they're gone, they're going to be gone. Uh, and I did a low print run. Uh, it wasn't very high. 
I think about half of them are gone now. So I'm going to have a huge holiday sale coming up here in October where you'll get a lot of money off by purchasing the book. But I just didn't want to go in that direction. And, and if the books sell out, what I'd kind of like to maybe turn my sights to is the world tours. Maybe start mm -hmm. Sweden 63 and mm -hmm. end, in, end in the Philippines in 66 and do the same, mm -hmm. same type of format. Wow. That, that would wow. be wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be that would be that would be very wonderful. I was also going to ask the you know we've seen how big tours are done today, and obviously it was quite different. The Beatles were somewhat closer to the fans than a lot of the stars are now. I mean, how was it? How, how much more dangerous was it for them then? Well, in '64, I think they really learned a lot. I mean, if you look at some of the archival video of them arriving at the Sahara Hotel. I mean, it's a crush. I mean, they're being handled and touched and, you know, they're barely getting into to a secure area. So I think they learned a lot in 1964. And as a matter of fact, in the 1965 tour rider, Brian added 50 more policemen. He wanted 100 in 64. He wanted 150 in 65. But another thing that they did that they changed in 65, and I think, and I've talked to Mark Lewison about this, and I think this is another Beatle first. You know, we talk about all these firsts that the Beatles introduced, was the backstage pass. There was nothing in 64 where you could, you know, hey, you know, it's like an all-tour pass. I know there was some stuff at the Hollywood Bowl that Bob Eubanks printed up for the DJs and special guests. But in terms of being having all access during the whole tour, there was nothing like that. And in 1965, Tony Barrow came up with the idea, hey, let's print up this pass. It's, of course, it's in the book, but it's basically, an, it's basically an identification pass. And they were given to the support acts. They were given to people closely associated with the tour, like GAC. Uh, the promoters and different things like that. So if you wanted to get close to the Beatles in 1965, you had to have this pass. And in 66, they even added another layer of security and they added a different color pass. It was a red pass. The red wow. pass was the Beatles inner circle. And I actually have Brian Epstein's red pass uh, printed in the book. So those are the really high level, you know, you're not going to get to the Beatles unless you show this red pass to get to the inner sanctum. Hmm. You know that uh, Candlestick is now gone. Um, I have not been by there since they tore it down, but they have since they have since the, the McCartney show, they, it's gone. It is now gone. And um, I actually got to take a tour of the backstage area before they tore it down. And nothing had changed back there. It was really amazing how much it was the same. We even looked in the bathrooms. The bathrooms, we were comparing Jim Marshall photos of the area, and nothing had changed back there. It was really it was really <laughs> strange. It's too bad they had to take it all down, but they did. And uh, I mean, where they tore it down. There's also, and I don't know if, like I said, you say you're not going to do anything, but I saw a long time ago some uh, negatives or some pictures from the plane flight between Los Angeles and San Francisco. And the reason I remember that is because Joan Baez was in one of the pictures. I don't remember which year it was, though. So, um, but anyway, there there are those out there, too. Um, but in any event, Chuck, I mean, that it, it, looking through the book again today, it's just, it, I, I have to concur with what Alan said. It's, it's absolutely amazing, you know, the detail in that book. It's just absolutely stunning. I, I, is there is there a real possibility you'll do the world world tours, or is this just something you're kind of throwing around? I'm kind of throwing it around right now. Um, it, you know, as you as it's kind of like Mark Lewis, and you know, like when's that next book coming out? Oh, twenty five. <laughs> yeah, will be dead. Our kids will read it, kind of thing. It, it, these things take a lot of time, and you know, I can imagine how much more time it would take dealing with international contacts, and you know, dealing with people in France and Italy and Spain and. Uh, the Philippines, I mean, it would really be tough, but I'm up for the task. But, um, you know, you mentioned uh, Candlestick Park. I mean, what an iconic place to be demolished. And in the back of each book, I actually give an update on every venue they played and every hotel they stayed at and the current right. state. Of, and the address, if you're driving around, you can go look at it, you know, 
there's a few places that, you know, a lot of places are gone, but there's a few places uh, that are still intact. Uh, Steve, there's one right out by you where they stayed in 65 at the, right. at the Cabana. I believe it's right. uh, another... It's a Hilton or one of those properties or a Westin. Yeah, it's, I, I believe I believe you said in the book it's a Crown uh, Crown yeah. Plaza or something like that. Crown Plaza, it's still and there. That's, right, and they're I've been have, I've, I've been there. Beetle, they were going to have a Beetle night there. You know, the other uh, you should have went to that. They were they were doing something over there. Oh, right. I wasn't I wasn't aware of that. I have been there though. Um, I was there a couple of years ago, and we toured the Beetle. They have what's called a Beetle Room. And they don't t- they don't say who stayed in the room. I suspect it was probably not one of the group. I suspect it was probably somebody from the the party, though. But um, they do have one of the rooms reserved, and it has a plaque on the door and says "Beetle Room." I mean, that place hasn't changed very much either. It's really and what what's weird about that though is it's like uh, now if you were to drive from that hotel to Candlestick Park, it's like about forty minutes away. Whereas back in '65, it wasn't that at all. There wasn't that much traffic. But um, exactly, they stayed way out there in uh, in '65, which wasn't really close to Candlestick. But if you want to hear a great story about hotels and things like that, uh, when when anybody meets Bruce Spicer uh, after you buy his book or books, I should say, ask him to tell his story about his stay at the Doville Hotel in Miami Beach, and it's oh, real, yes. you'll get a kick out of it. Because the hotel had just identified the room for years and years and years, and Bruce uh, said, this is the real room, so uh, they had to correct their history. <laughs> mm. True. Uh, you mentioned the the lessons that, that the Beatles hierarchy learned from the 64 tour, and yet uh, there, was, uh, there was an incident in Houston that posed actually real danger to them. Yeah, the the Houston stop was uh, quite amazing. They had played Atlanta Stadium that night and then got on a chartered uh, their chartered plane and flew over to Houston. Which again, this is something today's rock stars just don't do. I mean, you know, they're so pampered. Uh, the Beatles were ha- hardworking. I had so much uh, respect for these guys. I mean, they'd play a show and get on the airplane and fly in the middle of the night, and land in the city, and you know, go all these places. But Houston, you know, they land in the like two o'clock in the morning or something. And there's four or 5,000 people there in 1965 waiting to greet them. Um, they were going to play Houston in 64 at Colt Stadium, but Brian elected to play Dallas. So they're pretty excited to see him. So as the plane is taxiing on the runway and, you know, four turbo props spinning, they break the barriers down and run onto the tarmac while this thing is is uh, taxiing around. And, uh, you know, back then a lot of people smoked and there's, you know, the engines are running and the Beatles are having quite a bit of fun with this, you know, and reading Tony Barrow's account of this, they were making bets as to, you know, who could, because they were thinking about taking off again. And they were saying, well, let's see who can stay on the wing the longest as we take off. <laughs> uh, yeah, but they were climbing up there and, you know, knocking on the, the plane windows and all that. And it actually held up their exit from the plane for almost a half an hour. Uh, the Houston airport officials actually had to uh, get a elevated baggage cart over there to the plane and they lifted it up to the rear entry. And the Beatles had to jump onto this thing. Um, I have heard some reports, though, and this is another one of these I would like to know if it actually happened, that Brian Epstein actually fell uh, to the ground and injured his back, and that's kind of what started the whole painkiller thing. I'm not sure hmm. if that's true. I don't believe that's true. I think there would have been bigger press about that. And it's a long way down from a rear end of a plane. We're talking probably 15 to 18 feet. I mean, I... I don't know if Brian would have done so well, but there are pictures in the book of him sitting in this elevated baggage cart as fans surround it as they try to get the Beatles to the Houston terminal. Very interesting. Now, that night, the Beatles played two shows at the Sam Houston Coliseum. And those two shows uh, later on, I guess in the 70s, became one of the one of the best Beatles bootlegs. Uh, what was the source of, especially the high quality of of that recording? 
Or those recordings well, I, were too sharp. I, I, I think that was my first bootleg, Beatle bootleg record I ever bought. Mm -hmm. Uh, of course, I have pictures of them at Shea Stadium in 1966. On right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but man, it looked good to me. And, you know, I mean, yeah. Sam Houston Coliseum, this must be some big outdoor venue in Houston. You know, that's what I'm thinking as a kid. Uh, but it wasn't. And, you know, we've just realized these things have kind of just trickled out through the years, along with Alan's wife, Danish wife, you know, imports sure. came in too, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was Dutch. <laughs> sound engineers back then, and they got some great recordings. I mean, it's so wonderful to have this historical archive that we can go back to and listen. And and even some of them are not complete. Like if you get a great uh, thing from the Atlanta show in '65, a lot of versions don't have Dizzy Miss Lizzie in it. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and you got to find the one that has Dizzy Miss Lizzie. But fortunately and thankfully for those sound guys at wherever did it, uh, we have a great, uh, great archive. And we really have to thank Tony Barrow for recording that last show. Uh, but I'm still still sad today that that cassette ran out after 33 seconds of Long Tall Sally. Isn't that unbelievable? <laughs> I, um, in, in a lot of cases, didn't radio stations record them? You, you mentioned a couple where, uh, of um, radio stations that were going to provide start-to-finish coverage, and, and you don't say whether or not that includes the concerts, but it sounded to me like the Houston shows, for instance, were, must have been recorded by a radio station. They're, they're clearly not audience recordings. you know. Exactly. So. Yeah, and they're yeah, because radio stations wanted to simulcast these things because you know they felt that hey, if we got if we got the opportunity to promote the Beatles, like we're the ones that are the official sponsors, we're going to record this thing and we're going to share it with our fans, the fans that couldn't go because there wasn't any tickets available. Mm -hmm. But Brian was so just worried about anything getting out, um, you know, as early anywhere in America, obviously. I mean. Remember in Jacksonville, they weren't going to come on stage until those five cameramen from L.A. were going to pack up their stuff and get out of town, which Derek Taylor just waited on stage until that happened. You know, Brian was worried about uh, Denver and, and recording the show there. And, he, he act, you know, he tried to get one of the KRLA jocks to the, he berated them for trying to re record the show, which he wasn't doing anything. He was just standing there. So he was very aware and wanted to keep the product pure. Hmm. Sort of too bad, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really. You know, I mean, I, I can understand his point of view at the time, but these recordings are now really the stuff of history. It lets you know a lot about what went on. Oh, very much so. And, and, and also a little bit of, you know, pop culture history as well, when you have things like, the you know the prelude to the Sam Houston uh, shows with uh, Russ Knight, who was kind of the the big disc jockey in um, in that part of Texas, right? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and uh, uh, so you hear a little bit of of his patter and scolding the crowd and all that that sort of stuff. Yeah, actually, if I yeah, were, he says, no. I would be more embarrassed if I were him than if I were the Beatles. <laughs> well, yeah, right. <laughs> Right. So, ladies and gentlemen, please sit down because you're not going to see a blessed thing. If you right. look down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I've, I've been hearing, too, and maybe you guys know more. I've heard of a, a, a tape floating around from the 66 Toronto show that even has all the support acts. Has mm. anybody uh, ab actually, um, I was given part of that, and I actually ran... Uh, excerpts when they auctioned it off. I don't have the whole thing though. But yeah, I I I was I when they auctioned it off. I was the auctioneer sent me uh, excerpts of it, and I was able to use part of them. Um, I re I remember that very well. Does Barry Tashian know about that? He doesn't. Ah, because uh, it seems like he's he's made almost a career out of. You know the the Barry and the remains little, <laughs> you know their little fifteen minutes of glory, opening opening for the Beatles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, I think uh, 
for some of these festivals that, that are around the country. I think Barry Tashian would be a great guest, and no one's really kind of gone after him. I think yeah. he's, he's a great guy. I've spoken with him. He's, I think he'd be uh, available to do things and play. He's still a musician he, today. Yeah. He's, he has appeared at Beatle conventions before, but it's been a while. Long time. I know, I know he was at one of Charles's conventions. This is quite a while ago. It's, it's got to be over 10 years ago. Mm. I'm looking up my information on, the, on that tape, and it has the Ronettes. I'm not sure. I'm looking to see if it has everybody, who else it has. Um, but it definitely has the Ronettes. The, the Ronnie-less Ronettes. Mm-hmm. The file I have is marked uh, the Ronettes. So let me see. Um, okay. Ooh, really? This says there is... Um, uh, pre pre show announcements. Then the remains. The remains are on here, according to this. Sure. Um, then Bobby Hebb. Then the Circle. Then the Ronettes. Then the Beatles. And then after show interviews. So, yes, yeah, all that that that's all on there. So there you go. Well, let's hope a Dutch import comes over this way. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, again, that's a little slice of pop music, uh, of pop culture right there with, uh, you know, with the, with the circle who had, you know, the only two hits they really only ha- ever had that very summer. Right. Mm-hmm. I th- one thing that's, uh, that sort of surprised me, even I've, I mean, I've read it before, but never quite believed it. But the, the degree to which the Beatles were involved in choosing the other acts in mm-hmm. a lot of cases you know, I, I always thought, you know, when they said, oh, the Beatles, you know, and it's specially invited them. I always thought that was just hype. But it, it turns out, reading your book, that uh, that they did in a lot of cases. You know, the thing about Cannibal and the Headhunters, and you say that Paul said he wanted the na-na-na-na guys. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know and others, too. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting. You, you would... You'd sort of think that if it was widely known that the Beatles had actually wanted these specific performers to be on the bill with them, that people might have listened to them more carefully. True. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But there's, you know, you, you look at all three years, and there were some great support acts. I mean, let's face it. Uh, yeah. The Bill Black combo minus Bill Black. I mean, if anyone should have been with the, uh, you know, touring with the Beatles, it would have been Bill Black. I mean, mm-hmm. they love mm-hmm. Bill and his bass playing. Paul owns his bass, owns his bass now, yeah. Sure. Yeah, right. exactly. Well, they were, a, they were a complete natural, you know, to be there. But I think, uh, you know, GAC had most of the responsibility for hiring the support acts. Um, I know that Jerry Weintraub was involved in putting together the discotheque dancers, one of my favorite support acts. Uh, (laughs) you know steve would look in those white go-go boots but um you know they were great and then you know gosh 64 he had the exciters uh you know that group changed dusty springfield's life and got her into the music that she wanted to play Mm -hmm. uh you know jackie the shannon frogman henry uh you know the circle king King curtis king curtis Sure. Yeah, I have to agree, Al. I mean, those two Circle songs were amazing in 66. I mean, I think they were the, some of the best songs of 66. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. No question. And what's really strange is I'm looking over the set list here. They did, besides Red Rubber Ball and Turn Down Day, they did, and they did Red Rubber Ball twice. They did Money. They did I Get Around, This Diamond Ring, Big Girls Don't Cry, and Hushabye. Huh. Wow. And, <laughs> and, and Stay. So. Wow. Yeah, I know. That's kind of, that's really, you really... That's a long set for... <laughs> sure well, it's, is. It's, it's, it's the, the diversity, I mean, they covered the Beach Boys, well, the too, Gary, sure. Lewis, Gary Lewis, the Four Seasons. Hushabye is also a, another Beach Boys song, and Stay uh, um, would, would also be the Four Seasons, so... Sure. Uh, it, well. Yeah, it's... And, yeah, well, I mean, a, a number well, of they covered Right, it. they're both doo-wop songs from the late 50s right. that they covered, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, one of the one of the things I wanted to do in the book um, was to pay homage to the support acts because mm-hmm. I really knew that these people traveled with the Beatles or were a part of the the, the the tour, and so I really wanted to dedicate a section of the book for each year uh, for each support act and actually wrote you know a thousand words about each one and included photos of them. 
um, because they just didn't get a lot of publicity back then. Uh, and some of them are around. I mean, uh, you know, a couple of the circle guys are around. You know, we've talked about Barry Tash and she's around. I even or he's around. I I even interviewed a couple of the discotheque dancers who are sure. around. And Bill Medley and, from the Righteous Brothers. Talk, talk like a Dutch uncle to get her to share some photos that she had locked in a vault of, of her on the plane with the Beatles. Wow. So that's, hmm. What about Sounds Incorporated? <laughs> oh, one of my favorites. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody say what? Yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, they, look, they were the last group to, to be on stage before the Beatles came on. And we amazingly see a great historical document in the Shea Stadium film of them. Mm-hmm. They brought a lot of energy to that stage and really revved the crowd, revved the crowd up for when the Beatles got on stage. Because these people are sitting here by this time at least an hour and a half. Sure. Their lungs are just, you know dead already their voices are dead waiting for the beatles they're frustrated uh all cried out and you know the beatles come on and they get to see him for 30 minutes and that's it it's over now there's never been yeah. any tape that's emerged of any form aside from that leonard harris uh, news film of you know talking to the fans before the show and thing saying aren't the beatles finished uh, that kind of thing. But there's never been any tape that's emerged from the 66 Shea Stadium show. No, there isn't. It's really, uh, really strange why it hasn't. And a uh, couple differences with between 65 and 66. The one difference, there was about 11,000 less seats. Right. But like Ringo said in Anthology, he said, gee, the Beatles only sold 45,000 seats. I guess they're all out of style. <laughs> yeah. you know? And uh, one other difference with between 65 and 66 was Ringo's not on a drum riser in 66. He's just down on the stage. So they must have, like, trashed it after the 65 show yeah. and never decided to build another one or never wanted to. So he's, he's down on the floor with the, with the group on that, uh, that show. Hey, Chuck, can you give us an example of what you would consider to be amongst the most interesting of the radio wars? Because there are so many stations, the top 40 stations of the time, that were competing with each other to sponsor these concerts. And, and one thing other. that I didn't know, I didn't, I didn't know until reading your book that um, the reason why the Beatles played at Candlestick Park in 66 was because see so where the, the leading DJs in San Francisco, who are also promoters, were kind of furious that they lost out to uh, Cal Palace taking the show, and that I thought that they thought they were going to be the promoters for that for that show. Yeah, one of the things that I in researching the book is I found that Brian Epstein was a really loyal guy, and the people that supported him in '64 were definitely going to pe- be the people that he was going to go to in '65. Uh, there was a huge West Coast promotion team of Al, uh, Lou Robin and Alan Tinkley who uh, turned down the Hollywood Bowl in 64. They thought they could never fill it. Bob Eubanks sold it out pre-internet days in three and a half hours. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when they came back in 65, you know, Brian Epstein's going to give the show again to Bob Eubanks, even though Robin and Tinkley tried to get it from him. They're they're also going to give it to Paul Catalana up in San Francisco because he uh, took a a chance on him in 64. So... You know, Brian kind of promised it to Big Daddy uh, Tom Donahue and um, the other guy. What's his name, Steve? Uh, Bobby something, Bobby Bridges, or he was the partner of uh, Big Daddy. They were getting that 65 Cal Palace show, and, and they didn't get it. So they actually, when the Beatles arrived in, in San Francisco, they served them with a lawsuit. They threw it in the, 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 the service guy, the the guy that delivers the summons, he threw it in the window of the limousine with the uh, the Beatles inside. And Paul McCartney actually has a quote about it that I put in the book that uh, this dirty guy served him a uh, you know a summons. A summons. <laughs> hmm. So uh, Catalana wasn't going to get the show in, in '66 because of the legal lawsuit that they settled and giving it to uh, to Donna Donahue who. Uh, promoted him at Candlestick. It was a, it was originally going to be played at Cal Palace in 66. They were going to do two shows there. 
And Norm Weiss sent a telegram to Brian saying, hey, look, we can do one show at Candlestick Park. Would you rather do that than doing two at Cal Palace? So that changed history. That uh, the, That's why Candlestick was the last show they'd ever done. Um, so, yeah, there was the, the radio awards. You asked about those. I mean, mm-hmm. <laughs> every city there was a there was a huge race to get the Beatles. And generally every city had two two, maybe three very powerful AM radio stations. I mean, a, AM radio at the day back then with all their DJs, the good guys and this and that. And um, so they would line up because if they got the Beatles promotion, guess what? Their ratings are going to be skyrocketing through that whole promotional time. People are going to be listening to that station. Uh, but I document in the book several of the wars. The one up in Minnesota was quite... Uh, notorious. The one in San Diego was actually funny. I mean, they had to actually sue the other radio station to keep this one personality out of the stadium or not even <laughs> in the stadium. Uh, because this was, this was really the way they made money. I mean, this was huge to them. And they took it very seriously. But yeah, I document all those radio wars in, in the book. Would you say LA yeah. and New York was LA and New York were the worst were the the biggest well obviously because they were the bigger cities but I mean were were they the more intense I think it was the regional cities that were more intense because mm-hmm. bigger cities had more stations whereas the regional cities usually had two stations it was either you listen to station A or you listen to station B and if you talk to Bruce Spicer you know he talks about the competition between the two New Orleans the New Orleans stations mm mm-hmm. mhm and, uh, you know, I think one of them was W. Ticks, and, and I think the other, I can't remember the other one, but they're in the book. But, yeah, the regional cities were the ones that really, you know, had the, the really intense wars. Because hmm. uh, hmm. uh, we, when we talked to Dave Hull, I remember Dave Hull telling me that there were some instances where they were getting stuff directly from Capitol, and, and um, one of the stations in L.A. was just absolutely furious that they, were, they weren't getting the same they weren't getting the stuff and i was in new york during you know and heard wabc and wmca and wins and heard that stuff going on and that was just that was if you were living in new york it was it was it was wonderful but it was wonderfully crazy with all the live reports and everything Mm -hmm. um that were going on during that those days it was just it was absolutely fantastic so uh this has been a very very fast hour uh, and it's uh, all to the credit of Chuck Gunderson, who uh, has been a, has been a, a fabulous guest. And uh, Chuck, just want to thank you for uh, for, for uh, coming by and uh, uh, regaling us with some great stories this last hour. Yeah, it's been great being with you. And uh, hopefully, we can do it again when the 50th anniversary of the '66 tour happens next year. <laughs> sure, <laughs> right? Chuck, okay. where where can people yes. get the book? Uh, they can go directly to my website, somefuntonight.com. They can go to Amazon.com. They can go to eBay, or they can go and get a signed copy from the the uh, thefest.com. And Steve, speaking of contact, where can people contact us? Uh, people can write to us at things we said today radio show at gmail.com. We're also on Twitter at things we said fab. Okay. And and Chuck, are you going to be making any other convention appearances uh, this fall? Well, uh, I think the conventions are pretty much done for the year. Yeah, um, I think so. I do have uh, I do have on my web page. If you go to somefuntonight.com, there's a lecture page, and you can book a lecture with me. I will travel to you. Uh, the lecture's free. Uh, and I, you can pick from one of three lectures, actually one of four lectures, the 64 tour, the 65 tour, the 66 tour, or your individual city. Uh, so it's about a 45-minute multimedia lecture. That's great. Well, Chuck, nice. again, again, thanks very much for, uh, for being with us. And for Alan Cozen and Ken Michaels and Steve Marinucci, this is Al Sussman and uh, for Things We Said Today, and we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.